my favorite movies right now, uh, probably top five for sure, um, Interstellar. Has anybody ever seen Interstellar? It is, it is a mind trip, really. I mean, I've probably seen it more than a dozen times. I understand about half of it, but I still love that movie. It is great. Um, and so what it is, it's set in kind of the not-so-distant future, and people on Earth are experiencing like this food crisis, right? Uh, they have crop blights and dust storms and everything, so they're, they're just struggling to survive. And one of the characters, his name is Donald. And Donald, uh, he was probably born around, say, the year 2000, give or take a few years. So he's probably somebody like would now be in like their early 20s or something like that. But he's an older man now. And he says this, he says, when I was a kid, it seemed like they made something new every day some gadget or idea, like every day was Christmas, right? And isn't that where we are right now, you know? And it's such a profound statement in the middle of people just trying to survive. But that's how it is for us, right? We're always waiting for that next best thing to come out, to get our, whole, you know, get our hands on. Um, but, you know, there really has been some things and some improvements that have been made over the past several years. And one of those things, if you're a car nut, you probably won't quite agree with me on this, but think about cars for a second, right? I remember when a time when a car got to 100,000 miles, that was it. You might as well just drive it to the junkyard. The, you know, the value depreciated. I mean, really, they had, whenever you looked at an odometer for some of these, they wouldn't even go to 100,000 miles. It's like the car company is like, well, how far should we take this? Well, 100,000 should be fine. They, you know, nobody's going to get it that far, right? And it would flip to zero if you just magically made your car go that far. I mean, now what do we expect, right? We expect cars to go 150. If you're taking care of it, 200,000 miles easy. You know, if you're changing your oil like you're supposed to, doing all that maintenance stuff. And then think about also, like, computers, right? If you remember the show Friends, there is a scene where this character Chandler, he comes into the coffee shop. This was in 1994, bragging about his computer, 12 megabytes of RAM, a 500 megabyte hard drive, building spreadsheet capabilities, and a modem that transmits over 28,000 BPS. I mean, that's a joke. We got that more in our, in our pockets right now, right? You can go to the computer. It's real easy to get something, you know, 256 gig hard drive now. That's like almost, almost nothing for us. But there has been some things, right, that people have tried to make new, people have tried to improve, and it didn't really work out, like New Coke. Anybody remember that? That was elementary school for me, and it was just bombed. New math, you know, <laughs> as all you parents out there had to stay up for hours and hours, you trying to figure out what in the world, why did they have to try to improve math? What was wrong with math, right? The Star Wars re-edits? Now, come on. I mean, look at this picture right here. Couldn't they have waited? That is a terrible job of the hut. I mean, it's like some kid just kind of took some clay and then just took a picture of it. It's awful, right? They couldn't have waited until CGI was just a little bit better. But, you know, I'm a fan with things improving. I mean, we do live in a great time with our technology. You know, it's a lot of fun. Um, you don't have to yell across the house and say, hey, get off the internet, I have to make a phone call. And then you're calling your, your aunt in California and you're paying by the minute for a long distance. I mean, I don't miss that, right? I like the improvements that we've had. But we have to be careful, right? We do have to be careful on which path our progress is taking us. Because when you get beyond the material things, we need to ask ourselves, where are we going? Where are we going as an individual, as a church, as a society? And even just as important, we need to ask ourselves, what are we leaving behind, right? Because when you start traveling down a path, a road, something is getting further and further behind. I mean, seriously, we learned this watching Sesame Street, right? Y'all remember this? You probably can hear this picture near far. I mean, if you, your kids, I mean, this is like ingrained, right? So you cannot be near and far at the same time. And yet we tend to forget that with every single step that we take, there is something that we are leaving behind. And that is so, that's why it's so important to know where we are going. And but something else I think is important is that we should not go down a certain path for the sake of progress in and of itself. 
okay? We should understand that new doesn't always equal better. Tradition isn't always bad. Now, you, of course, you can flip that on its head, right? Tradition isn't always better either. But new doesn't always equal better. We need to think about the why, right? We need to think about what is the goal of what we're doing. Why do we do what we do? Why are we going in that direction? And so here's the problem. When we move beyond talking about technology and material things and start getting into how we live and what we do, and we start making up our own standards and our own moral compass that does not line up with biblical teachings, we are leaving something very important behind us. You see, one of God's attributes, one of the things that makes God God is he is immutable. Now, what does that even mean? You know, every time I come across a word I don't understand, I always think of this, right? Everybody remember that scene in Pirates of the Caribbean? And my wife, Courtney, has an extensive <laughs> vocabulary, so she sees this look on my face a lot. I'm like, what did you just say? You know, just dumb that down just a little bit, you know? But immutability, immutability is this. Immutability is when something is not subject or susceptible to change or variation in form or quality or nature. So when we talk about God in this way, here is what we mean. The immutability of God means he is not subject to change. There is nothing, there is no one who can change anything about God. He is unchanging in his nature, his desire, and his purpose. And at the same time, God is not indifferent to our human activity and our need because we can always count on God's concern for human righteousness. God changelessly answers prayer in accordance with his desires and his purpose of holy love. So all the uses of divine power and strength, they are consistent with his attributes of wisdom and justice and love. So we must not be tempted to think of God in ways that make him human, right? He is not us. Praise the Lord. He is not us, and his ways are not our ways. And so the big idea here is that God is unchangeable. He is perpetually the same. He's subject to no change in his being, his attributes, or his determinations. And this becomes a hard concept for us to understand, right? Because the world around us is just constantly changing all the time. Constantly changing. It's hard for us to understand this attribute because there's nothing else in all of creation that we can say this about. I mean, the closest things we have are these massive rock formations that we see, you know? But even rocks erode. A lot of them were formed this way because of erosion, but it seems like the closest thing we have to look at to get some understanding of this attribute that belongs to our only God is this. And so that being said, they, they use these word pictures in the Bible to des try to describe that and try to speak of the glorious nature of God when they are declaring that God is our rock. If we look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 3, it says this, I will, pro I will proclaim the name of the Lord. And how glorious is our God. He is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. So saying God is the rock, it gives us this idea of like confidence, right? Confidence in him and strength and an immovable nature. And it's just trying to convey um, this nature of God. But the problem is that language, it really does seem to fail us a lot, right? And this language that we speak and we assign words, meaning to, and stuff, it, it really is baby talk, you know, compared to being able to truly understand who God truly is. However, God used people to write in languages, right? And trying to use words which help us get to know him. But even languages, they grow, right? They grow and change over time as society continues on. And again, there's another, there's our, another problem, right? Because we're able to understand that God is unchangeable, but then even language is changed and the things that we're trying to use to describe. And so the concept is simple, but it is still very complex. And since God has no beginning and God has no end, he also doesn't know change. And this is why scripture declares him to be from everlasting to everlasting. We look at James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, 
with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So there is simply no variation with God. But the implications of this is exactly what makes the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ so powerfully amazing for us today. Now, we're going to expand on this later, but for now, let's look at the immutability of God, and we're going to look at it in three different areas, okay? So the first, God is immutable in his essence. God is immutable in his essence. God and his nature and being are infinite, right? There is no beginning and there is no end. There is no measurements that are sufficient to explain God. I mean, you think about this, the size of the observable universe, just what they've been able to see with their telescopes, right? 93 billion light years. Go try, go, go home and look up how big one light year is. And we're talking about 93 billion light years. And God is still beyond that. He is bigger than that. Most scientists agree that the universe had a beginning. But God is infinite. And we and the universe are finite. And we have a beginning. We have certain limitations. But this is not the case for God. There was never a time when God was not. And there will never be a time when he shall cease to be. God is uninfluenced by time. No matter how much time passes, if all time could be understood and compared to eternity, it's like a, just like a drop in the middle of the ocean. And this also means that God does not evolve, he doesn't grow, and he will never improve. He can't improve. Nothing can be added to him, and no one can enhance him at all. This means that everything he is today he has always been, and he will always be. Look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. He says, it says, I am the Lord. I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Now, what a curious thing he said at the end. But when we read this, we see what is so important to understand this attribute of God. It's because when he sets his love on someone, even when they turn their back to him and disobey him, like the Israelites did so many times after time after time. If you go read the Old Testament, they constantly, constantly did this. He cannot, God cannot stop loving them. Now, that doesn't mean there's not consequences for sin. There's absolutely consequences for sin. But the children of Jacob were not destroyed because God doesn't change even when we constantly change. God is gracious when we absolutely do not deserve it. And who doesn't deserve it? All of us. And he is this way because he does not change. Once he sets his love on you in Jesus Christ, he will never change his mind because he is immutable in his essence. God will not change for the better because he is already perfect. And being perfect, he cannot change for the worse. If he changed, he would not be God. And he has no need to change since he is perfect and fully in control of all things. He is uninfected by anything outside himself. Improvements or deterioration, it is impossible with him. So God is always the same. And that is why he revealed himself as such as we see here in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, speaking to Moses. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you. Now, this is kind of confusing to us sometimes, right? Because like, I am who I am, and we can say, well, who is that? And he would say, I am. It's kind of like, who is on first? You know, you just keep going back and forth. But God is simply who he is, which is immutable in essence. Therefore, his power, it can never diminish, and his glory will never fade. The essence of God is constant, and this is why Isaiah 40, 28 said, he does not faint or grow weary. So being the ultimate source of all life and never being diminished in power and glory is given with him. It is given with him. And because God's essence is immutable, God is immutable in his attributes. So all his divine attributes, the things that make God, God, they are unchanging. So whatever the attributes of God were before the creation of all things, before he called something out of nothing, the same attributes of his character are still the same right now, and they are going to remain forever. God's power, his wisdom, his holiness, his decrees, his foreknowledge, his supremacy, 
his faithfulness, his patience, his wrath, his goodness, and his grace, they are all unfailing, undiminished, unimpaired, and unchanging. And the attributes of God can no more change than his deity can change. And then on top of all this, he loves us with an everlasting love. And so he continues in faithfulness to his creation. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23 says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now this should be an encouragement for us this morning. And if you don't know Jesus yet, if you haven't repented of your sins and began your journey with Jesus, you need to know that he is the God who loves you and he desires you to be with him today. So don't let the actions of flawed human beings get in your way of a fulfilling relationship with God. Right? Amen. People mess up. But the good news is there is truly no one or nothing that is like God. You can try to put people on a pedestal, and you can may think there's someone else out there who has all the answers, and you might try to think of something or someone that rises above the high God, but it is simply impossible. People and things, they are, will constantly change, and they will constantly disappoint, but nothing about God will ever change. But there is even more about the immutability of God. God is immutable in his will. He is immutable in his will. God's will, it never varies. It's never in flux. He has determined his will and his counsel, and it never changes. And sometimes this is where people will eject to this God of Scripture. They will even try the Scripture to do this, right, to eject. So we're going to, we've got to be very careful when people try to pit God's word against the nature that is revealed in his word, right? Because there's no, actually, there's no contradiction in his word because there's no contradictions in God. All right, so let me show you real quick. Let me show you how this idea of God being immutable in his will is fought by some well-meaning people. Genesis, or cha Genesis chapter 6, verse 6 says this, And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So this is how we see God describing himself to us as he is ready to unleash the flood upon the earth, right? And so regretting in other translations, sometimes it's repenting and speaking of God's disposition in those days. So are we to think that God changed his mind, right? Or that he turned his will around or that he actually, he didn't see this coming. He's like, what? You know, no, right? That he, had not, he didn't have to modify his plan. But, but listen to this. If you read Numbers 23, 19, it says this. God is not a man. He does not lie. He is not human. He does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? And in this one in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret. For he is not a man that he should have regret. So, if the scriptures truly don't contradict themselves, then what do we do with this, right? How, how do we reconcile? Well, there's actually a simple answer for this. It's, it's this. It says, when God is speaking of himself, he is graciously accommodating our limited capacities with basic language. God is like, this is, this is about all y'all can handle, right? So God describes himself with human characteristics just so we can understand him better. And he describes us because... If you look, he'll describe himself as like clothed, uh, with bodily members. Sometimes he'll, he'll say you know, ears and eyes. You know, he even speaks of himself as walking sometimes, even though John 4.24 tells us that God is spirit. So what does uh, Genesis 6.6 6 mean when it says that God regretted? Well, biblical scholar A.W. Pink put it this way. He says, when God institutes a change in his dealings with men, he describes his course of conduct as repenting or regretting. So you got to remember what we said before is that God is not indifferent to human activity or need and that we can always count on God's concern for human righteousness. Because you got to keep that in mind. So we should not make a mistake of a loving God who cares for his creation as a fickle God who has to change his mind for those that he created, right? He cares for his creation. 
And so there are times that we, can, we, can, um, we think that we can change God's plan or the path that he has set because he has allowed us some little, you know, some free will. But think about this, though. Our small decisions, small and grand, you know, they're insignificant to what God has ultimately set in motion, right? Even things that we think are huge deals, you know, they are nothing compared to God's will. Now think about it this way. If you've been, if you've been in the beach the past, I don't know, decade or two, right, that, they're, try, they're trying to gain back the beach, you know, that the water's continually coming in, and the towns will go out, and they'll, they'll try to get more beach back, and then all of a sudden a storm will come in, and it, that water comes in again. If you go to um, Ocean Isle on the east side of the island, I mean, water's pouring in under houses and stuff. You know, it's, it's the same thing. We cannot, our, our little things, even the grand scheme of things that our leaders of the world are trying to do, they're not going to do anything for the will of God. That is his will. So you and me and the so-called powers, they cannot stop the will of God. Job 23.13 says this. It says, but once he has made his decision, who can change his mind? Whatever he wants to do, he does. God's purpose, it never alters. And he is not like us. So one of the easiest ways we humanize God is when we think of him as changing his mind or amending his plan because of some sort of unforeseen circumstance, right? No circumstances unforeseen to God. You know, he is never surprised. God doesn't have to change his mind or amend his plans because he's not like us. You know, there are two things that cause humans to change their minds and reverse their plans. And one of them is the want for foresight to anticipate everything. Right? And the other is a lack of power to execute plans. And people will change their mind for these things. But it's simply not a problem with God. He is all-knowing and he is all-powerful. And so there is never a need for him to revise his directives or his will. Psalm 33:11 says, But the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. How long does this plan stand for? Forever, forever. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16 to 18, it says, Now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath. Now, check that out, right? He, he only had to bound it to himself because there's no one greater, right? So God also bound himself with an oath so that those who receive the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. The scripture tells us that God actually desires to show his immutable or unchanging character. So why is that? Why would God desire to show us something of his nature that we can barely comprehend? Let's look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 again. It says, I am the Lord and I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. So he goes on to tell them that they have turned away from God, but that God would still have them return back to him. And they said, God didn't get mad and leave them. He didn't give them exactly what they deserved. He told them exactly how they could go back to be in a right, right relationship with him. And for them at that time, he told them they were robbing him by not giving as they were directed and promised. But then he promised to bless them if they would just simply come back. You see this, God desires to show off his immutable nature to us because it is that nature that keeps him from destroying us when we fail to follow him. Even when we are sent in sinful disobedience to him, he is rightly wrathful. He is able to... To simply forgive, though, when we repent, because his nature will not allow him to remove his love from those he has placed it upon. So what does that mean? It means this. It means that we can depend on God when we cannot depend on anyone else. We can depend on God when we cannot depend on anyone else. He doesn't just quit on us like some people around us do your friends, or your parents. Psalm 146.3 says, Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. 
We can only put our trust in Jesus for our salvation because it is found in him alone. No matter what the world tells us the answers to society's problems are, they simply cannot be trusted because they are creatures that are mutable, meaning that they change constantly. There is no salvation found in them. And if you listen to them enough, they will try to redefine salvation. People who like you today, they may hate you tomorrow. You can go decades trying desperately to follow the teachings of the world. Then you disagree on one thing, and they have a group of people coming after you, right, trying to cancel you. We see it all the time. Because what is acceptable by the standards of a world that does not care about biblical truth is always changing and moving. It is always looking for that next best thing. Because if Satan can keep us confused, then we are distracted from what truly matters in life and we just keep going down a road that leads to death. Because what's at the end of the road is not just unpleasant or comfortable. It is either death or it is life. So you have this culture that is just waiting for you to make a mistake in their eyes so it can be forever held over your head. Or you have a God that is ready to forgive you. How much more radical is that than anything in the world that the world is trying to teach you today? The forgiveness of God. And we can see how quickly people can change even in biblical times. We'll probably hear about this a little bit next week, Palm Sunday. Even the so-called, you know, they didn't even have the so-called news telling what, to sh what they should or should not think. That multitude cried. They said, Hosanna to the son of David. And then they quickly changed their tune, right? And said, away with him, crucify him. So we can simply not rely on people, individual society, the same way that we can rely on our God. However unstable I may be or however fickle our friends may be, we got to remember that God doesn't change. If God was anything like us and he changed his mind today about something that he said yesterday, then we could never have any confidence in him. If he was committed to us and offering salvation but then quickly changed his mind and then removed it every time we messed up, then we would have no hope at all. So we should give him all the praise we have because he is our rock and his purpose is fixed and his will is stable and his word is true. God's character is a permanent reality and it, it will never change. So his promises will never fail his people. And this immutability of God means that his word is true and his promises will be fulfilled no matter what. Look at Isaiah 54.10. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. So we should be glad that God never changes his mind and that his power never fades and he never fails in his promises and that he never ceases to work in his people there are some people that say that we must walk away from biblical teachings, right, so, so that society can progress. But why is that? Is it like, is it our curious nature, you know, the tap into the unknown? But I, I believe that true progress for society is actually radically following Jesus. What if society did that? If you desire to truly travel that path that is less followed, they radically follow Jesus. If you truly desire things that you fully can't comprehend, then radically follow Jesus. Some people wonder why we should care about something that was written so long ago when they're talking about the Bible. Yep, no, society has changed. We've evolved past all that. But I look at the, as the Bible as one of God's great miracles. You think about this. It was written over a period of 1,500 years. Forty different authors ranging from farmers to kings in different countries on three different continents, touching on hundreds of different subjects, yet it still gives us one united message from God and our salvation through Jesus Christ. And I think one of the reasons we want to walk away from God is because people have failed us. But you cannot let the failures of people determine what you 
do or what you don't do with God and the gift of salvation that he has for you. People will disappoint you. This includes politicians, of course. I don't even have to say that really, right? Pastors, church leaders, cult leaders, you know, celebrities, maybe a parent, brother, sister. People will disappoint people. You know, people are flawed. People are mutable, they're fickle, and they are definitely liable to change, right? But thankfully, our God is above and beyond all of that. And so the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is made infinitely more powerful when we understand the immutability of God. We read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Even though we were not there when he hung on the cross, we still receive his forgiveness today because of his immutable nature. Even though we can't see him walking with us, we have his word, which is sure and which is true, and it reminds us that Jesus forgave those who came to him, and he will forgive us as well. The nature of Jesus doesn't change, just like the Father's nature doesn't change. John chapter 10 verse 30 says this, Jesus speaking, he says, I and the Father are one. So if anybody ever asks you, well, did Jesus actually say he was God? Right? Here it is. Jesus declared that he and the Father are one, and his word says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are all unchangeable, and they're never able to be diminished or improved upon. They existed before we came into existence, and they will exist forever and ever and ever. So if you have come to see today that God is infinitely far above you in every way, shape, or form, and you've come to realize that you cannot go on living without God, without His forgiveness, and without His salvation... If you've come to a place where you see your own sinfulness and your need for a Savior, then you call upon the name of Jesus today. You call out to Jesus and you ask him to forgive you of your sins. And he will surely do it because his word declares he will never change. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, it goes out to all sinners and all those who hear it and receive it with humility. Those who acknowledge their sins, repent, and ask for forgiveness, they will receive forgiveness. God is immutable. He is unchanging. And because he is, this next verse should give you comfort. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the good news from an immutable God. I don't care. It doesn't matter how many failings you've had. You come to him and you confess your sin and he will forgive you because he does not change. No matter where we go, he's right here with us. And so hopefully some of you right now, you realize that God hasn't left you even in your darkest times of your life, that he still loves you. So we're going to have a time for you to respond to what God is saying to you right now. So if everyone will stand, we're going to take a moment. We're going to give you an opportunity to what the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do this morning. And maybe it's to get on your knees up here at the altar. Maybe it's to get on your knees at your chair this morning, realizing that you are a sinner, but God, but knowing that God is here and ready to re for you to receive his gift of salvation through faith in Jesus. Listen. Having a right relationship with God begins with acknowledging your sin and then a humble confession of your sin to God. Romans chapter 10 verse 10 states, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. This repentance must be accompanied by faith, specifically faith that Jesus' sacrificial death and miraculous resurrection qualify him Jesus alone to be your Savior. 
Romans chapter 10 verse 9 states, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So being right with God is a matter of your response to what God has done on your behalf. He sent the Savior. He provided the sacrifice to take away our sin. And he offers you the promise we find in Acts chapter 2, verse 21. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So for now, just be obedient to what the Holy Spirit is prompting you this morning, prompting you to do. And we're going to, um, we're going to worship together in song. So if you want to come up to the altar, the altar is open. If you just want to pray here at your seat, and that is fine as well. But let's just have a moment of worshiping our God this morning and obeying the prompting of the Holy Spirit.